So hi, uh, welcome to A New Hope. Uh, I can't use a title for a talk like that without an obligatory Star Wars reference, so there you go. Uh, the actual subject that I'd like to talk about today is actually uh, why games are positioned to revolutionize programming languages. And that's a, a pretty bold claim, but I think uh, by the end of this you'll be in a good position to agree. Um, my name is Mike Lewis. I currently work as a lead gameplay programmer at ArenaNet on the Guild Wars 2 franchise. Uh, I've been a computer programmer for about 20 years, give or take. Um, I've been focusing on games since about 2002. Uh, but I've been interested in games for a lot longer than that. And in particular, I've also been interested in programming languages. Um, I grew up in a, a poor family. Uh, I think the technical term is low income. Um, we didn't have a TV, which in the late 80s, early 90s in the USA was kind of a weird thing to not own a TV as a family. But we did have a personal computer. And that was incredibly important for me because computers turned into my gateway into video games very quickly. But more interestingly than that, video games turned into my gateway into programming. And all that started with a very simple question. What happens if you open up a computer program in a text editor? Now, I remember very vividly the day that this happened. Uh, I was about five or six years old uh, in the uh, family room in our home. And uh, my father walked into the room and said, uh, hey, let me show you something on the computer. And he proceeded to open up uh, a video game that I had played a lot of at that time called Commander Keen. And uh, he showed me what happens when you open a binary executable file in a text editor. And I don't know how popular it is to do this kind of thing these days. I don't know if it's something that anyone here has even done. But if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's a very fascinating experience. And you'll be greeted by something like this. Um, this is, to, to little me, this was a very fascinating and magical kind of construct. This didn't mean anything immediately, but I knew that it had something to do with the video game that I played. And I wanted more than anything to understand how to do this for myself. How could I make these games myself? And it was a long journey, but I ended up there eventually. But the key revelation was that games have to be made like any other software. Uh, they're a product. They're something that we have to work on, we have to put effort into. But they're also unlike other kinds of software for a lot of reasons. Uh, we have special types of hardware now in computers that exist entirely because games made them popular. Uh, things like graphics cards and sound cards. Sound cards are now so common, they're integrated into motherboards in computers. They don't even make separate cards anymore. That's just that useful. And that came about largely because of people playing games on their personal computers. So I think games are important as well because they solve a lot of different kinds of challenges of software development, all kind of in the same place. They are not like most software that does one or two things. They have all kinds of stuff. We've got rendering and physics and audio and all these different components that come together to make a fascinating game. And without all of that, we wouldn't have uh, as nearly of an interesting a challenge as software developers in creating these games. One of the tools that we use to address this challenge is uh, actually using multiple languages and paradigms. So, for example, we have a lot of low-level languages in games like C and C++. There's a lot of code written in those languages out there. Uh, we also are starting to use a lot of higher level languages, especially if you're using like, Unity or a similar engine like C Sharp. Um, it's been common practice for many years in the game industry to use script languages like Lua or Python or JavaScript uh, to drive the game logic while the lower level high performance code is written in like a C or C++ type language. Uh, in the realm of paradigms, we have things like shaders, which are a totally different form of thinking about software. They're tr data transformations. And that's not usually the way we think about writing code, but they're incredibly important for doing graphical work. And audio digital signal processing is very similar. Uh, you'll write a, a thing that looks a lot like a shader that transforms a sound from one thing to another as it runs through the, the processor. We also are starting to see a, a big upsurge again in visual scripting systems, so things like uh, blueprints in Unreal, where uh, you can click and drag nodes and connect them together on a graph and turn them into a description of what you want your program to do as opposed to having to type out code. Uh, there's also a huge uh, upsurge right now in general purpose GPU programming, which I think is very interesting because it's kind of full circle. We started with graphics cards that were designed specifically to make games more uh, performant. And now we've discovered that we have a lot of performance resources sitting around in our graphics cards, and we can use them for things that have nothing to do with games. So that's a very, I think, a key example of why games are important for driving forward technology as a whole. So I mentioned earlier that I'm very interested in languages. And uh, uh, the reason for this is I think languages are kind of the currency that we spend when we do programming. Uh, they're how we exchange value of ideas and thoughts and instructions. 
we use languages every day, day in and day out, but a lot of times we ignore the shortcomings of those languages. Uh, we don't typically question why they are the way they are, right? Like if something happens and we get a weird bug, it's, oh, that's just a quirk of C++. That's just, you know, undefined behavior or whatever. And we just hand wave it away and we don't really question why our programs are doing what they're doing. A lot of times I hear programmers wishing for better languages, which uh, is a lot of why I'm here today. But the other part of why I'm here today is that almost no one is actually trying to build anything better right now. Uh, for the number of programmers that we have in the world today, which is uh, record-breakingly high, we have a startlingly low number of programmers who are actually bothering to try to drive forward tool development in the realm of software languages. So I'd like to present a challenge, and there's going to be several of these challenges through here, uh, through the rest of the talk, but uh, I want you to question why. And this goes to everyone, not just programmers, but everyone in game development. If you run into something that doesn't make sense, just ask why and go chase it down. Understand why things are the way they are. Pay attention to the flaws in your tools because those are super important. Those are the things that hang us up and keep us from getting things done. And if we're not paying attention to flaws and working on refining and iterating on our processes, then we're doomed to, to stagnate and plateau in our development. And the last part of this is look for superior answers. If there's something that you can kind of get away with and it works, but it's not great, just think about what it would take to, to put a little bit of extra effort into it and look for something that's really, really solid. So I think games and, and languages cross over in a very interesting way. Um, general purpose languages are, are pretty much designed like C or C++ or C Sharp. They're designed to solve a lot of different problems, but not all at the same time, right? Like you, you'll write one kind of program in a language and it'll do its one task and that's it. Games have a lot of different challenges that we have to solve all simultaneously. And so as a result, I think games demand a lot of the languages that we use to write them. Uh, we, we want things like features in a language that cooperate smoothly with each other. I think C Sharp is a fantastic example of a language where the, the features all integrate very cleanly and, and very nicely. Uh, we also need many different levels of abstraction because sometimes we're talking directly to hardware, we're talking to video cards and, and uh, you know, networking devices and things like this. And sometimes we're dealing with game logic, we're talking about things that happen over the span of many seconds or many hours even, depending on the type of game. And it's not as important to, to be as concrete in terms of hardware, but it is very important to be concrete in terms of the ideas that you're trying to communicate to the computer. So the bottom line of this is that what we really need is an ecosystem. We need tools, we need libraries, we need places that we can go to get support and help, and we need customers, because ultimately we don't want to make games just to go out into the vacuum. We want games that people will play. We want games that people will enjoy and share and be inspired by, and maybe hopefully come around and make games of their own someday. So another challenge is find ways that your language or languages, if you use more than one, uh, could be better for, better for making games. I think this is really important because uh, there's a lot of languages out there, but not all of them have had the attention of the game development community to make them as good as they could be for the kinds of things that we're trying to create. So I mentioned uh, hardware briefly earlier. Um, I just wanted to, to explore this a little bit. Uh, I think games have had a, a very significant impact on the way that hardware has developed. Uh, the existence of graphics cards, like I talked about before, is, is pretty much down to entirely games but they have come full circle again and they're now being used for things that have nothing to do with gaming. Um, the PS3 cell architecture with the SPUs um, is a controversial development in hardware but also very important because it helped us think about uh, different ways to organize our code. Uh, and even the design of commercial CPUs and computers has been impacted by games. Uh, the way that caches work, the way that we get instructions for doing parallel computation like SSE, uh, all of these things are, are completely driven by games and similar forms of software. So we have a huge opportunity to push forward and drive those areas of technology uh, into places that they probably wouldn't go if it weren't for people trying to make you know, great games. Uh, even drivers and operating systems on the software side have been shaped by the way that games interact with hardware. So here's another challenge. Uh, I don't think the hardware people should be having all the fun. I think we should have the opportunity as game developers to go ahead and push technology as well and make the, the cutting edge go even further because ultimately uh, the, the consumer of the hardware is the software. 
and we are making the software. So if the hardware people have all the fun and do all the interesting development, eventually they'll get ahead of us and we'll stop making interesting things that push the limits of technology. Um, going back to languages, uh, one of the most popular languages obviously for games is C++. But C++ is changing very quickly. And that's something that you can get involved in. Uh, there's a website. If you go to isocpp.org, you can get involved in helping to shape the next standard of the C++ language. It's actually remarkably easy. Uh, the, the community is very welcoming, and they're very prepared to hear interesting ideas from people that are pushing the envelope in technology. So we can go out and make the next version of C++ even better than it already is. But I don't think we should stop there. I think there's so many great languages now that I'm actually uh, making a conscious effort today not to, to pick any one and dwell on it too much because there's a lot of excellent work being done in creating new languages for general software, but there's vanishingly little effort going into game development in these languages. So I would suggest that if you're a programmer and you're interested in, in playing with games and languages, uh, just pick a new language once a year. There's enough of them that you can do this easily once a year, and just try it. You don't have to commit, you don't have to make a whole game in it, you don't have to do anything amazing. But if you just download it, install it, you know, write hello world or whatever, and then move on, then you can get a better feel for how these languages are evolving and shaping uh, the future of software development. But more than that, I think it's important to offer feedback to the communities that create those languages. Because if they know what's hard about getting into their language, if they know what features are missing for making great games in their language, they'll be able to address those things. If we don't go tell them that, hey, I tried to install whatever language and I got this error and I just gave up because I don't care that much, they'll never have any opportunity to improve that experience for other developers. So it's super important to, to follow through with that feedback. So ultimately, we can help make all of those new languages that are out there even better than they are now, especially by making them better for games. So I've hinted briefly that uh, C++ is, is uh, changing, but the reason for that is that no language is perfect, right? Like there's, there's no such thing as A is always better than B or whatever. Uh, the, the problem is that context is super important, right? If we don't know that writing a website in Z80 assembly is a bad idea, then we might set out to try it and have a really bad time. But that doesn't mean that that assembly language is a bad language, and it doesn't mean that websites are super hard to make. It just means that we picked the wrong tool for the job. So for the same thing, the same reasons, uh, like we wouldn't use a high-level scripting language like Ruby to do hard real-time robotics like the, the Mars rover, for instance. Uh, and you know, there's many examples. But uh, I want to go back to that original challenge, which is pay attention to flaws and question them. If these languages aren't perfect for everything, what are they perfect for? What is our context? Our context is games. We're trying to make games entertainment for people to play and enjoy. So why do we use C++? I think this is a very important question. So like any engineer faced with a very important question, I did the best thing I could possibly do, and I consulted my partner. And uh, she came up with several very interesting reasons why people uh, prefer C++. Uh, well, the first one that I'd, I'd like to pick on is low-level access to hardware. And I think this is a fallacy, because uh, ever since Windows NT, which was back in the late 90s, uh, we have hardware abstraction that sits between our software and the actual drivers and the hardware on the machine. So C++ modern programs don't talk to the hardware at all. They talk to layers and layers of abstraction that go down to the hardware. But it's very rare to write a game that actually pokes the hardware directly unless you're on a, a very constrained platform. So another uh, popular reason that's cited for using C++ is manual memory management. The irony here is that this is one of the biggest sources of bugs in modern C++ programs, things like manually newing and deleting pointers. Uh, it's actively discouraged in C++ 11 and later versions of the language because it's so hard to get right. So if we're using C++ for manual memory management, but we're not supposed to use manual memory management, it seems like a bit of a problem. So I think the real reason why we're doing C++ so much is that everyone else is doing it. Uh, Libraries, APIs, and existing code at major studios, for example, uh, often assume that you're going to be just working in C or C++. It's just a, a, a sheer inertia thing. And so that's, I think, the biggest reason why we see so much of that language pushed forward in the gaming industry is because it just has momentum. So the, 
the unspoken question here is if C++ is, is just surviving on momentum, then why, why should we be looking for something different? Maybe it's good enough. Well, I don't think it's good enough because I think it's diverged from the real world in terms of how software is created and the way that hardware works. Like I just said, we don't even talk to the hardware 99% of the time when we're making games. So why are we dealing with a low-level language that's supposed to be designed for dealing with hardware? Uh, I think there's more problems with the language, though. The, the compilation process, just taking C++ code and turning it into a running program, is a giant mess. Um, the compiler can only see one code file at a time. And so we have these things called includes, which are a hack to get around the fact that I can only read one file at a time. Now, if I have includes, they have to be in the right order because the compiler can't see things out of order in the file that it's reading. If I try to use something at the top of the file and define it at the bottom of the file, I get an error. This is a very 1970s kind of problem, and I hope that that immediately suggests to you that we shouldn't be having it today. Uh, header files are actually a problem because of the way modern uh, disks and CPU caches work. They slow down the compilation process. They don't make it better. The thing they were originally designed to do has actually backfired severely in the last couple of decades. So we have these things. Uh, they're very popular in a lot of game shops a few years ago where we have a unified build. And basically, you just take all of your C++ files and stuff them into one giant file automatically with a script and then compile that instead of actually splitting everything up into separate files. The sad thing is this actually works really well and uh, gives you major speed boosts on a lot of compile times. Another thing that has become very popular, especially in the Windows world, is the pre-compiled header, which is basically another workaround for the exact same problem. You just take a bunch of header files and cache their, their compilation process and then come back and read that cache instead of reprocessing all of the text the next time you build the program. But it's more than just compiling things. There's also fundamental features of the language that are awkward because of this, and templates are a great example. Um, you can either put everything in a header, or you can use explicit instantiation. There's, there's ways to get around it. But ultimately, the problem is C++ doesn't do what you would expect with a template. If you put a template in the wrong place, you get all kinds of errors, and they're pages long, and it's incredibly hard to uncover, and it's very unfriendly to newcomers. So I'm not done. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the syntax rules in C++ are completely ludicrous. I think they're absolutely painful, because most modern languages can be parsed uh, very simply. They can actually convert from text to a binary representation in a very small amount of time. C++ is actually recognized uh, in the language development community as a very difficult language to parse. And that means that building tools on top of it, making tools for syntax hints, for uh, automatic completion, those kinds of things, is actually incredibly difficult. And that's very unfortunate for a language that has so much inertia. So just to give you a quick example, uh, this is a small snippet of code that looks like it's doing something straightforward. And if I had to read this, not knowing what the next four bullet points on my slides are, um, I would guess that this is basically going to create an object in green. It's going to be of type interesting class. And it's going to be initialized with something of basic class that's default constructed. So that's what you would expect, right? That's what you would think if you're familiar with the C++ syntax. Unfortunately, you'd be very wrong. What this actually does is it's a declaration of a function which takes another anonymous function as a parameter. This is actually enforced. This is mandated by the C++ standard that you have to interpret this code this way. You are not allowed to interpret it as a variable being constructed. This actually has a name. It's been called the most vexing parse by Scott Myers, and this is a, a very famous sort of problem with the way that C++ is structured on the syntax level. So unfortunately, the rest of it doesn't get any better. Um, if you accidentally forget to use a const qualifier when you're overloading a function, then it'll do the wrong thing. And you, you can scratch your head for a while and ultimately figure out, that oh, I forgot to type const in this one place. Uh, there's actually four or five permutations of this that can bite you if you're not careful. Um, if you've ever looked into the rules for how templates actually turn into code, uh, they're frightening to say the least. 
Uh, there's a, a notion called argument dependent lookup, which is a very long section of the C++ standard that describes how templates figure out what you're actually trying to substitute into the slots of the parameters. And the rules are so convoluted that I'm not even going to try to summarize them. Uh, the type system is actually broken in C++, in my opinion, uh, because you can do things like ask for a type float, and the compiler will happily let you use an int instead of a float and never warn you or anything that you've just completely rounded off a bunch of inf interesting information. Um, there's a very popular one, which is virtual function calls in constructors. Uh, if you've ever run across this, you know very well that uh, it will do very unexpected things. Uh, if you dig deep enough, and this is why I think asking questions is, is super important. If you dig deep enough, it actually makes sense why this happens. But it is not at all intuitive, and it's extremely unfriendly to someone who doesn't know why the system is built the way it's built. And this is a personal favorite of mine. Um, if you have a, a const character string, and you want to add a number to the end of it, like an int, just concatenate the two together. If you do this in a language like Python or JavaScript, you just add the plus sign and everything just falls out and it works. You get a, a string and a number, nothing to it. If you do that in C++, you're liable to get very bizarre results. And if you haven't ever done that by accident, uh, I encourage you to go home and try it because it's, it's actually very enlightening. So ultimately, undefined behavior is everywhere in C++. And undefined behavior is basically a shorthand for we don't think it's worth specifying because maybe somewhere some computer might do a better job if we just let it do some magic. And this is kind of a bad way to develop software because we're not in the habit of doing alchemy, we're engineers. So there are actually websites that, that existed for years. One of my favorites is Guru of the Week. Uh, there's a link to it there. Um, this is Scott Myers again talking, or excuse me, this is Herb Sutter, uh, talking for years, once a week, about a severe problem in C++ that bites people and causes them confusion and pain. If you've created a programming language that can sustain a weekly newsletter for years with all the pitfalls of what you did wrong in your language, I think we need to ask if there's not better tools out there. So at this point, you might be wondering if I have a little bit of a bias against C++, which um, obviously the answer is yes. Um, just to, to underline why I am so interested in this, uh, Earlier this summer, I was working on some Guild Wars 2 work, and I learned about a crash bug that was affecting on the order of hundreds of players every day. So every day, hundreds of people would play Guild Wars 2, and randomly, the client would just crash and close. And there were no patterns that we could tell from the, the diagnostics that we got back. Uh, the player reports were all scattered. They were like, yeah, I was doing this thing, or this totally unrelated thing way over there. Or, there was no, no order to the, to the crashes that we could figure out. Uh, ultimately, it took me three weeks of studying crash logs to find out exactly what was going on. And I ended up building um, modified clients for the game so that I could add debug information that wasn't available to the ordinary live game just to track this bug down. And there was three weeks of this. And I finally figured out that it was one uninitialized variable. Just one. <laughs> so I, I gave this away earlier, but yes, I do have a vendetta against C++. I think it kicked my dog. Uh, that is actually my dog. Uh, so the, the next question I think that's important is here is, can we fix this situation? I would say no. I don't think we can actually fix C++ because we would have to break almost all of the code that's out there in order to change the language dramatically enough to make it better. I've estimated with uh, very sophisticated and rigorous mathematics, which of course means I wrote it on the back of an envelope, um, that there are billions of lines of C++ in the world today. If you think about what it would mean to break all of that code for everyone, it's pretty easy to see that it's impractical to just change C++ and turn it into a dream language. Now part of the problem here is that compatibility is already extremely difficult. So if you have multiple platforms, anyone who's done a port, and I'm sure is familiar with this pain, you go from Windows to Linux to the Mac to mobile devices like Android and iOS, whatever. Uh, your code is not the same. It's different on every platform because things are not compatible. 
And the power of C, when it was originally introduced, was that you could write the same code and with very minimal changes, use it on many different types of devices. But we've lost that in C++. And we've even lost it to a large extent in C. Uh, a, a big part of the problem here is that compilers are not compatible with each other, and even not compatible with new versions of the same compiler. So it's very easy to write code that works in one version of Visual Studio and breaks the next time they do a release. And then, of course, with the language being revised repeatedly, uh, we've had C++11, C++14, and now C++17 is being uh, finalized, if I remember correctly. Uh, all of those have breaking changes to the language. So there are already compatibility issues that make it extremely difficult to keep your code running when you upgrade your, your compiler platforms. So our best bet is to just use better languages when we're writing new code. Of course, it's because C++ has such inertia, it's also incredibly important to maintain interoperability with that code. So we don't want to throw away the C++ that's out there. We should just look for better ways to write everything new. So what are these better languages that I've hinted at? Well, um, I've already said I don't want to endorse anything specific, but there's plenty of options out there. Um, some of them are very experimental, and some of them are actually ready to go make games in right now. There's a lot of different combinations of features and design decisions that go into these languages, and some of them are appealing to some people, and some of them are not as appealing. Uh, it's, it's a very personal choice, I think, uh, what languages you find useful for the kinds of things you're doing. But ultimately, uh, very few of the languages out there are really ready to ship real games with. Uh, most of them are not set up to interact with the graphics hardware, with audio hardware, with network stacks, the, you know, in some cases. So there's just there's plenty of uh, challenges left to address for how do we actually make a game in, in any of these new languages. So a question that I would pose is, if game development is such a, a big demand on languages, why aren't game developers pushing languages harder as a technology? If we have the power to evolve these languages and make them dramatically different and more powerful, why aren't we tapping into that now? So my challenge here is make a game in a different language. It doesn't have to be a very big game. It doesn't have to be a very complicated game. But just pick a language, and you can do this at the same time as you, you play with new languages once a year. Uh, just pick a language and make a game in it and see what the experience is like. So that leads me to the idea of involvement. Uh, if you want to get involved in making languages better, you don't have to write a compiler. You don't have to build a debugger. Uh, these are things that are available as challenges if they interest you, but if you're not as inclined to work on those things, there's no need to worry about, you know, do I have to learn assembly language or anything like that. You can be very useful just by offering feedback. Just going to the creators of languages and telling them, this is what I found difficult, this is what I would like to see, and these are the kinds of libraries and tools that I would like to, to work on or see someone work on for your language. Uh, a lot of the languages out there need that very desperately, and they need real-world users, people who are actually pushing that language to the limits to find out where to improve the most. The best part is there's, there's no, uh, no, no commitment involved. If you don't want to stick around the language for very long, you don't have to. Um, just telling the, the community that, hey, I tried your language and I didn't like this thing about it, that can be a large amount of information just by itself, and that can be a huge help to people who are trying to pinpoint uh, where their languages should go. Uh, one thing I would recommend, if you're going to play with a new language, um, think about the option of leaving your work available as open source for other people to play with. You don't have to do it. It's just a nice thing that if someone else is interested in that language, they can come along and see, oh, I see that someone has already looked at this language and explored what it takes to make a game in this language. Maybe things are better now and I can push forward, or maybe I can find a way to push forward myself. But ultimately, um, you know, don't, don't just dump your work off and, and, and abandon it. Um, but also, just remember, as you're, as you're doing this, just be curious. Think about the things that you run into, the problems that you encounter when you're working in these languages that aren't completely ready for games yet. Always ask why. 
Because with a couple levels of asking why, you can usually drill down into some very interesting problems in the way that things work. And those problems range from technical issues to community and social issues that may not be obvious up front, but are super important to getting these languages uh, developed into a better state. So I'd like you to invite you to imagine for a moment, what if, what if we never had to think about virtual inheritance hierarchies again? I don't know how many people have worked on a code base that uses virtual inheritance, but it's actually pretty terrifying. Uh, not the most pleasant experience. But if we could completely avoid that nightmare forever, wouldn't that be good? Uh, what if we could take garbage collectors and custom memory allocators and use them together in the same game? What if our build times were faster and we did less recompiling of everything all the time? What if we knew that entire categories of bugs were simply physically impossible because of the way our language has been constructed? But I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to say we should also imagine getting parallel or even network distributed processing for basically free. What if you never had to write another thread again? You just wrote code and it worked and used all your CPU cores and everything was great. What if you could actually take a chunk of your game code while it was running and replace it with something different to fix a bug, to iterate on a design, to try a thought experiment? And you didn't have to do it with a language like Lua. You could do it with a native language that actually compiles to fast machine code. Think about what it would be like to have the ultimate debugging and performance tools. If you had any tool you could imagine, what would it look like? What would it feel like to use? What would be different between that tool and what exists today? So I'd like to introduce you to a personal project of mine. Um, this is the Epoch language. Um, the tagline is, is a little presumptuous, I think, but uh, it, it came from a discussion forum thread that happened in 2006. Um, the language is uh, something that I've been working on for quite some time, and I'm very interested and passionate about. But I have to give you some disclaimers before I talk too much about it. Um, I'm not here to sell you on this language. I don't want this to become the, you know, hey, everyone should go out and write Epoch programs uh, talk. Because it's not ready. It's really not ready. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into it and a lot of iteration that needs to happen before it's, it's super ready for, for people to actually build games and interesting software in. Uh, there's no guarantee that it'll actually go anywhere. This is a personal hobby project. It's, a, it's something that I do for, for the passion and the fun of it. But um, the, probably the biggest issue is I will probably change my mind about how it works at some point in the future. So I don't want to tempt anyone into getting committed to this language and then change it out from under them in six weeks or whatever. So, uh, Like I said, this started out uh, as a result of a discussion forum topic in 2006. Uh, the, the world was a very different place 10 years ago. Uh, the languages that were available all lacked something. And I couldn't really pinpoint what that something was. And it's still taken 10 years to get a good feel for what I feel like I'm missing from languages today. But nothing that was available then was even remotely close to addressing these problems. Uh, part of the issue was there were very few new languages actually being developed at that point in history. So to start a new language project wasn't actually as as strange as it may seem today. Uh, there was very little competition. And more importantly, there hadn't been a new version of C++ since 1998, with the exception of a minor standard revision in 2003. So it had been eight years since we'd seen a revision to the C++ language, and there was no competition. There was nothing interesting going on in the realm of making languages for games. And that was the environment that I started working on this project in. So 10 years later, um, I still feel like games are uh, an unbelievably powerful resource for improving the way that computer programming technology works. Uh, but a lot of new languages have also become available during that time. Unfortunately, none of them really focus on that, that mystery something, something that I've been trying to pursue for all of this time. So ultimately, my personal itch is still not scratched. And I think that leads to an interesting challenge by itself. Um, if you have a desire to improve something, to make a difference, to do something better, to do something impressive, memorable, if that's your 
drive, if that's your passion, never give up on that. Because ultimately, that's the thing that's going to make the difference in the world. It's people who are willing to pursue that for 10 years and not stop. That's the thing that we should all be thinking towards as we leave conferences like Consul and say, we're going back out into the world, how do we change it? So a couple of examples of, of how Epoch is different from most languages. Um, in a lot of languages, we have this notion of uninitialized data, which is basically just a fake optimization, which means instead of putting a value in my variable, I'm just going to let it be some random garbage, and hopefully the programmer will remember to put something meaningful in there before they try to read the variable back out. Unfortunately, this is almost completely irrelevant today because redundant initialization is something that optimization compilers can remove trivially. So if I set a variable to zero and then immediately set it to one, the compiler is just going to say, oh, you don't need it at zero, you just need it at one. There's no point in, in initializing it and in not initializing it more than once anymore. So Epoch does not allow uninitialized data. You literally cannot construct a variable of any kind without initializing it. So there's an entire category of undefined behavior that just goes away by making this rule. And in practice, it's actually very pleasant. Uh, it forces you to think about all of the ways that your program could be in a valid state or an invalid state. And if you always have to initialize something, you always have to be in a valid position. You can't create garbage that's just randomly left over from the last thing that ran. And again, an entire category of bugs just completely disappears. We can't have that three-week nightmare that I had earlier this summer uh, chasing down un uninitialized variables. So another example, um, there's a, a popular, or semi-popular, I guess, nowadays, uh, use of inheritance where you take the implementation of one class and inherit it into another class. And this is ostensibly done for code reuse. Unfortunately, most of the time we've learned that inheritance of this, this type, code implementation inheritance, is very brittle. It's very prone to errors. And in fact, contemporary design experts generally recommend not using inheritance at all unless you absolutely have to, or this form of inheritance. So instead, we use interfaces and composition. Uh, interfaces are basically just a way to separate, a way to talk to a class from the actual implementation of the class. And composition is really just as simple as this class has a couple of member variables that, that uh, support what it does. So Epoch does not have any notion of inheritance. There is no type of inheritance in the language at all. Composition is used if you need to assemble behaviors from several components. Uh, there's a notion called protocols, which I'm currently working on, uh, which is used for hiding implementation details, so something that you would typically use an interface for. And Epoch also supports generic programming through a template-like system uh, and it has a type inference engine which basically lets you not specify type data unless you absolutely have to. The compiler will figure it out for you. Uh, and this allows for a lot of code reuse because you can write code once that's a template and say anything that can substitute into this template that compiles cleanly is valid code. So any type that I feed it is automatically supported, even though I didn't write a copy of that function for every different type that I might want to put in. The last component of uh, the inheritance-free programming model is we use something called discriminated unions, uh, which I'll get into more detail here in a second. So like I said, inheritance is often misused in C++. Um, one of the common ways I've seen it misused is to try to get multiple types to behave like one type. So for example, we might have a base class, which is a pie. And then there's an apple pie and a cherry pie. And maybe someone decides later on in the expansion pack to add a pizza pie. So in order to, to represent this, the notion of discriminated unions or algebraic sum types is very, very powerful. Essentially, all we do is we say pie can be apple, cherry, or pizza. And now all of a sudden, I can store a container of pies without having to do any kind of interface, without having any kind of base class, anything of this nature. And I can refer to those pies and know what they are because they all have a tag on them. They all know what type they are at runtime. So I can look at a pie in a container and know that it's apple pie and process it appropriately. But I don't have to have a virtual function to do that. 
It also eliminates the need for casting, which is a very interesting source of bugs in C++. Uh, and in a lot of other languages, we'll give you invalid cast exceptions. So this is a very interesting way to just sidestep an entire category of problems in software programming. Um, another thing that's different about Epoch is we don't have a, a notion of a null value. Uh, there is no null pointer. Uh, typically, it's impossible if you look at just a function's uh, declaration to tell if it handles null. All you know is that it takes a pointer or a reference in, in languages like C Sharp or Java, uh, and you don't know whether it's going to properly handle if you pass it a null or not. So we end up with all these little checks everywhere. It's like, if this is null, then return. If that is not null, then return. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. So in Epoch, there is no null value. Instead, there is a type called nothing. Now, the important thing about this is that since it's a type, it can be used in a discriminated union. And that means the compiler can check and make sure that we've actually safely handled it. So if I have a function that says I can accept nothing, then it has to have a path that looks for nothing and handles it. If I have a function that says I can't accept nothing and I try to pass it nothing at runtime, or compile time, excuse me, uh, the compiler will literally say, no, you can't do that. You have to handle the fact that this pointer, this reference might be missing. So the larger uh, constructs of, of object systems that use these kinds of notions of inheritance and null pointers and all these kinds of things, they tend to be very simple in most languages. And so they lead to a lot of workarounds. Uh, inheritance, again, is, is bad architecture. Um, we have this notion of public protected private members in C++ and a lot of other similar languages. But it really isn't a sufficient way to talk about what code should be able to do what. So I'm working on a proposal right now for Epoch, which is uh, I'm calling tasks, which are essentially uh, objects that live in a very, very tiny bubble. Uh, they can be automatically spread across CPU cores or even a network if you want. Uh, you can also take a specific task and replace its code at runtime with hot swapping to do updated uh, versions of that, that sub specific task. And it also has a very fine-grained access model. So you can specifically say, uh, I don't want the brake controller to be able to be interacted with by the steering wheel or by the passenger with the Bluetooth headset, but I do want the brakes to be interacted with by the brake pedal, and only the driver can access the brake pedal. Uh, this is actually a real example of a breakdown in software access control that happened to um, a very popular car manufacturer who I won't name uh, just recently. Uh, this is a real problem, because if you have a system where it's important to limit what can do what, uh, private and protected are not enough to, to protect you. So unfortunately, all this, this part is, is still under construction. This is still um, very much tentative for the language's design. But uh, I don't want to stop dreaming. Uh, like I said before, I think it's incredibly important to be uh, persistent in our hopes and our dreams for how things should change. So here's a few things that I think are important. Um, I think it's important that Epoch programs don't have a runtime library. If I want to give someone a game that's literally just a simple graphical you know, experience and not you know, install a, a whole bunch of libraries and you know, dependencies and things, I should be able to do that. I should be able to give you a, a two or three megabyte file and you just play my game. Uh, that should totally be an option. I want to have first-class integration with Visual Studio and also Visual Studio Code for those who prefer that. Um, I want to have cross-platform support. I want to be able to work on more than just Windows because that's what I do now. That's what I do for work. That's what I do at home. That's where Epoch has lived its entire life is on Windows. I would love to be able to take it to a console or to a handheld device. But most of all, I want to create easy resources for continuing to build this language. I want people to be able to contribute and get involved and do the kinds of things that I'm challenging everyone here to do today. Uh, I want those resources to be accessible and dependable so that when someone does decide that they want to go make the language world better, they can just come be a part of it and, and do that. 
So just to give you a, a snapshot of where things are at right now, uh, most of what I've talked about today is already actually implemented and working. Um, I've built prototype bindings to a library called BGFX. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a very powerful low-level graphics API wrapper. It lets you uh, do things like hot swap between OpenGL and DirectX uh, on the fly, which is super cool. Uh, it also demonstrates the interaction between the language and classic C APIs. So that's, that goes back to something I said earlier, where we don't want to throw away a lot of existing code. Excuse me, we want to preserve that code and just be able to take advantage of it using a better, newer language. I've been working recently on integration with Visual Studio 2015. Uh, I have syntax highlighting, uh, syntax hints, and a build system all working, so you can actually build programs and go run them and debug them and everything. Um, proper debugging is on the way. I don't have uh, good support for breakpoints and things like that yet, but that's, that is still in process. Um, the compiler uh, does produce native Windows 64-bit executables, so you can run them on any Windows computer uh, right now. And I'm also working on the third generation of a garbage collector design, which supports something I alluded to earlier, which is uh, interacting between manual memory management and garbage collection. And this is something that I think is super critical for games because we need the freedom to use garbage collection when it's expedient, but we also need the power to use manual memory management when we need the performance and can't afford the garbage collector's unpredictability. So, all of this is motivated by game development experience. All of this is coming from my professional time and even my time at home working on games. Uh, this is all about making gaming development better. And I don't want to limit the language to just making games, but I do want to use games as a very powerful uh, inspiration, if you will, for the kinds of things that the language is capable of. So if you'd like to know more, uh, I'll give you this link. Um, you can also contact me personally at this email address, and I'll, I'll have this up at the end as well. Um, but before I leave, uh, leave you for today, I wanted to give you some really big challenges. Um, think about what's good and bad about the tools that you use. And this is true for everyone, not just programmers, but everyone that's interested in making games. I think we should all think about the things that are good and the things that need improvement in the way that we do things, because that's how we're going to make progress. I think everyone should dream big about how much better things could be. I think things are amazing right now. Don't get me wrong. I think this is a fantastic time to be a game developer. But we can still do better. And I think as soon as we give up on doing better, we will stop being relevant as an industry. So get involved. Uh, go out, have discussions. Even if all you do is share a beer with someone after the conference and talk about what languages you like and don't like, uh, just Get involved in the process. Be aware that this process exists and that there are people that are trying to make this better. And if you want to do the ultimate favor to, to the open source language community, um, go ahead and join a project. Uh, again, this doesn't have to be a long-term commitment. You don't have to write a compiler. You don't have to work on debuggers. You don't have to do anything crazy. But uh, pick a language and talk to the people that work on it. Talk to the people that care about it and help them understand why games are important to them. So just to bring uh, the example that I had at the beginning of the talk uh, kind of full circle, uh, I took the test, a test program in, written in Epoch and loaded it in Notepad. And uh, there you see it. That is a valid Windows 64 executable image that will run on this laptop, in fact, if I uh, had the file still. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that's, that's where I've come in the last 20 years. Uh, this is where I started, was looking at programs and text editors, and this is where uh, I am now as a result. And all of that is due to, to games. So thank you very much. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. I just wondered if you had, uh, have you followed the development of Jai? Yes, I have. Um, very lightly, unfortunately. I haven't had the time to focus on it very much. Yeah, okay. then the question won't be very relevant then. <laughs>
you probably get this question a lot, but um, as, a, as a new student in the games industry, I've kind of fallen in love with programming. And what language would you recommend for me to kind of uh, make my, uh, like, develop in right now? Like, the best language for a newcomer to have. So um, right now, uh, probably the best sweet spot is C Sharp. Um, you'll be able to use Unity very easily with that and work with a, a very established set of engines and assets um, that use C Sharp that I think is incredibly useful, especially uh, at the beginning when uh, you don't necessarily want to have to make everything yourself. Um, Second to that, I would say, unfortunately, uh, you should definitely also learn C++ because that is still a very, very major player in, in the game industry. Okay, one more. I think uh, we have one in the back. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I started uh, my programming career in Java and then I worked as a C++ developer for a few years and I've ended up as a scheme developer of all things. And um, one of the things I see, uh, you're talking about that not a lot of people uh, try to make new languages and stuff. And my theory regarding that is that uh, Java and C++, like making compilers is a com or writing programs that write programs, is a completely different beast than uh, writing the code the way you usually do. While in a language like Scheme, it's basically the same thing. Do you have right. any comment or insight uh, or opinion regarding that? So it's interesting that you mentioned Scheme because Epoch actually began its life as a variant of Scheme um, back in 2007, I believe, was when we were working on that. Um, I think it's an incredibly powerful tool to be able to modify your program with something that looks exactly like the code you're used to writing. Uh, it's, it's actually something that I've explored briefly doing in Epoch, but that's still very far down the road. So I don't have any concrete uh, takeaway for that, but it's, it's definitely, I think, a, a very important observation that you've made that uh, we have a different mindset when we're writing a compiler versus when we're writing virtually anything else. And being aware of that has been immensely useful uh, for me as a language developer. Thank you.